Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 372. Everyone is born a genius, but the process of living degeniuses of them. Buck Fuller. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Make Your Movie Boot Camp. You want to make a feature film but have no idea where to begin. I feel you because that's exactly where I was when I first got started, but I finally decided to stop talking about making a movie and go out and just do it. After working in the business for over 25 years and working with some of the biggest clients and stars in Hollywood, I decided to finally make my first micro-budget feature film that was self-distributed, sold around the world, and I even got a streaming deal from Hulu. It took me years of hard work to learn from my mistakes and to get where I am today. I want to help filmmakers break through their own fears and show them the secret sauce on how to make a profitable film. The Make Your Movie Bootcamp is a two-day intensive covering on day one, micro-budget filmmaking, and on day two, the film entrepreneur method, where you learn how to create revenue from your feature films. We cover everything from flushing out your idea, the screenwriting process, finding money, crowdfunding, directing your film, post-production workflows, marketing, film deliverables, self-distribution secrets, and how not to get ripped off by predatory film distributors. The boot camp takes place March 28th and 29th in Burbank, California, and spaces are limited, so act now. Head over to mymbootcamp.com. That's mymbootcamp.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we have the award-winning producer, Jonathan Baker, who is the producer of the 2015 film Crown Heights, which won the Audience Award at Sundance, which was then sold to Amazon Studios. He's also the producer of the upcoming film The Banker, being released by Apple TV, starring Samuel L. Jackson and Anthony Mackie. And he is also the producer of one of the hottest films at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, Sylvie's Love. And if that wasn't enough, he's also the director of the underground stoner comedy Manifest Destiny Down Space Time, which is a hilarious film. If you like stoner films, you guys got to watch it. Now, Jonathan's worked inside the studio system when he worked over at Sony. He works outside of the system as an independent film producer and director. And if that wasn't enough, he's also an adjunct producer of feature film and entertainment economics at Carnegie Mellon's Master in Entertainment Industry Management Program. I mean, Jonathan has a heck of a resume, and I wanted to get him on the show to talk all things film, inside the studio system, outside the studio system, what it takes to get into Sundance, what it's like being in Sundance, what it's like to sell your movie at a festival and market of that size, and talk about the struggles of independent film, where the market's going. It's just a epic uh, interview, guys, and I really do hope you like it. So prepare to take some notes in this episode. Without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jonathan Baker. I'd like to welcome to the show Jonathan Baker, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Good to see you, man. Good yeah, to see you. Good to see you awesome. too, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, of course, man. Of course. So before we get into uh, the movie you directed and your new Sundance movie that you've produced, how did you get into the business? 
Uh, okay, good. Yeah, I, I was um, dyslexic growing up, and so I was bullied as a kid quite a bit. And my mother discovered I could um, – I had like a, a habit of tapping on tables and stuff in rhythm. And so I became a musician as I was learning how to read, and they – kind of sponsored every curiosity I had in the performing arts. And so I went from like drum lessons to trombone lessons to piano lessons to singing lessons to ballet, jazz, tap. You know, I was on musical theater. Like I was the glee kid before there was glee. <laughs> <laughs> so you were super, so you were super cool is what you're saying. I was the super nerd. I was the guy <laughs> that everybody hated and all the, the you know, the fucking the um, the the jocks wanted to beat me up. You know they were always so, threatening me. Were you in a lock? Were, were you placed in a locker, sir? I, I, dude, I was threatened so many times. Growing oh, up. me too, my uh, friend. I, I feel I, you. I, I but I luckily had a good friend on the football team who actually defended me, and oh. he was like my buffer. Uh, ben, God bless his soul. He he passed away when he was in the army. But um, it, yeah, so I had some heroes along the way. Whatever. And um, at the end of the day, my mother passed away when I was 20 and I stopped performing and I got into the business side and I just became, I thought, okay, <clears throat> I'm just going to learn how the money works and the financing works and just stay active that way until I kind of get over this crazy loss I had. And that, 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 that was it. I, you know, started um, right after going to University of Michigan School of Music for musical theater, I graduated and went to um, New York and just got a job on Wall Street um, to support myself, started spending money on shows that I thought would be interesting plays to produce, then uh, left Wall Street to go to the Nederlanders, uh, and that was my first big entertainment break, uh, working for Jimmy Nederlander. So so you basically, you, you got into the stable business of the music industry, and then you went into the stable business of, of stage and, and, and Broadway, and then you said, yeah. no, 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 I need something more stable, let's get into films. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It, <laughs> that, that, yeah. I, my, as my dad says to me, I, my brother's a, a surgeon. My dad's like, "Well, John, you're a risk taker." And I'm like, "Yeah, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad." <laughs> Dan so, Baker. Yes, yeah, exactly. All right, yeah. so let's talk about Sylvie's Love, which is now, uh, is, is, as of this recording, uh, is yeah. in the Sundance 2020 lineup, and it is yeah. competition, right? Is it in competition? Yeah. Yeah. So it's in competition, which is a very yeah. small it is. group. I mean, what, what small are we talking group, like yeah. 20 films in competition? 30? I think for... it's only 10 in dramatic, 10 in dramatic competition. Jeez, yeah. yeah, it was 10 in dramatic. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you are like the one of the one of the one of the one percent that actually. <laughs> yeah, the stats are really crazy. 15,000, I, mean, I think? 14, 15,000 films submitted? 15,000. Like I, I look at this like, because I mean, I've been going to Sundance since 97. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my first short film as an actor was in there. And it was an entirely different festival. Now it's just, I feel... I feel for the community of filmmakers who submit. Mm. It's such a tricky thing. And I just look at it and like, it's just, a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy ride, you know? So everybody, you, everybody who tries and submits should get a valor award. It's just, you know, <laughs> you finish the movie, everybody should get together and be in a stadium and have a rage at a party and be like, yes. But it's, it's pretty amazing to be there and, and actually, you know, kind of take the, take the real ride of it. So, you know, it's funny that uh, I heard Kevin Smith and Robert Rodriguez, uh, I think even link letter, all of them said that if they would submit slacker clerks or El Mariachi today, today. they would, they would never get it. I know it's a really, really different market. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about Sylvie's love. Tell us a little yeah. bit about the movie. <laughs> Sylvie's love is an amazing um, movie. And the fact that it's actually being made now, um, and it's 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 a very interesting sign of the times, in my opinion, as a producer. Um, Nandi and I were attracted to the script because it had so much jazz, and it was just a, a beautiful script that Eugene had written. And we we always look for things that are really sort of not in the mainstream, that are really sort of side over to the side that nobody else is going to make this. We should do it. And so <clears throat> the story is really what makes it relevant today because Tessa plays a young debutante African American girl growing up in Harlem and she wants she has a passion she wants to be a TV producer. So she's very uh she has um she's like a modern girl in, in sort of a bygone era and um and with that she falls in love with sort of the wrong type of guy which 
Namdi and I really related to because we're we're both musical guys and and it's he he plays a saxophone player. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And so their relationship is really, really sort of this beautiful love story. Um, and Tessa's character, Sylvie, really has to negotiate between her her ambition to be successful, to be a woman, mm-hmm. you know. And so she she goes through this sort of process where she really makes some tough decisions in her dilemma between the love of her life, clearly, and her career. And she has to reconcile those two things. And so she it is a female breaking the glass ceiling story, which is what sort of made it, it was like, look, this is a great story to make today because this is so fundamentally a part of the zeitgeist, the culture, the, you know, sort of the, the world that we live in. And yet it, it sort of operates because it's in the 19 late fifties and late and early sixties. It's sort of beautiful in that it just, it's, it's just this time capsule. It's very classy. It's super, um, romantic. And I think it really just plays, um, it's whimsical, it's sweet, it's charming, it, it's heartfelt. It has certain moments that you really feel for these characters and what they're trying to do with their lives and how complicated sometimes it gets. And then ultimately it's just kind of, you know, how it works itself out. So it's, it's pretty neat. It's been a, it's been a very special film. I've worked on a lot of different kinds of movies. <clears throat> and I, I tell you, I was talking to Eugene last night, I said, look, man, you know, this is a very special film. I'm I'm very proud of it. I think it's just it's an honor to be a part of the team, and it's just great. It's great to see it sort of have a moment at Sundance because it really doesn't feel like a Sundance movie. It it feels very, you know, big comparatively to the kind of things that Sundance tends to to focus on, mm-hmm. and that's that's why I think it's getting sort of its own sort of buzz. You know, what, what in your opinion, what are the films that Sundance focuses on? Because that has changed dramatically over the years sure. yeah 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 i think i think when we did crown heights <laughs> like when i read that script and i called and i said this is the movie that we need to make um i had been going as a buyer for sony i had i had gone as a filmmaker i'd gone as a professor and i've, I've seen it sort of move and, and shake and kind of zig and zag a lot but but sundance really does something which i think is sort of unique and and to be revered which is that it really focuses on an independent spirit like it focuses on truly unique filmmaking voices. And and for that, it's sort of, it can kind of go everywhere, but it has this counterculture to whatever you see as the mainstream box office. You know, Sundance is sort of leading the way in the independent space. So independent, that's Sundance, you know. So it's interesting to find and to work on a movie that has what I, you know, if I put on my old, marketing studio brain this is a this is a bigger you know cross if, if it is art house crossover it's not even art house crossover it, it feels like a more mainstreamy kind of studio movie um and i think the reason that it is there and the reason that i think it got picked is because it it tackles the more interesting sort of frame of what uh what's happening with race and what's happening um and it doesn't it doesn't uh it doesn't go to the obvious. It's not about, you know, African Americans sort of like being subjugated like Crown Heights was. This is about classy, beautiful, intelligent African Americans living a beautiful life and and figuring out how to make the best life for themselves right now, which is strangely independent. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that's what makes it so Sundance E. It just doesn't look like a Sundance movie because it's got a sort of a certain scope to it. Mm-hmm. But thematically, it's very Sundance. And so that's what I think is fascinating about the fact that it's there. Now, how did you attract such great talent? I mean, you have a great cast on this movie. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's interesting. I, I think that first and foremost, it's because it it truly is a great script. It was a, it was a beautiful script. Um, and then I think in terms of at least producerially, as, as, as you know, it's just like you climb up the ranks and luckily for us, when, when, when crown Heights got the audience choice award, there was this, okay, what are you guys going to do next? And we looked around, we were like, you know, we had, we had sort of a third and a fourth movie in, in, in focus, but, but we weren't at that level. We needed to find something in sort of the middle range. And, um, this movie, it, it was, 
brought to us by an extraordinarily um, amazing woman, uh, Gabrielle Galore, who who is really connected, and Eugene Ash, who also had his, his own sort of legacy in the entertainment space, and then and then Namdi. I think Namdi's um, especially uh, multi hyphenate, and his ability to um, not only pick talent, um, identify the right kinds of people to go to. Um, Carrie Barden, casting director, exceptionally um, well respected, and it just became sort of a uh, who do we go to first that can create the right lineage for every other decision for that. We focused on the Sylvie role. We had a couple of people in mind. And then it was um, it became clear to us that there was something special happening with Tessa, um, mm-hmm. not only because of her legacy at Sundance, but also because um, she was starting to kind of really get, you know, at a certain point where uh, sort of her star power could hang a budget like Sylvie. And there was this, you know, I was a fan of her work and a couple of other things that were independent, but then with Westworld and Men in Black and I was at Sony, there was sort of a lot of sort of, I don't know, there was a lot of synergy around her. We became friends with her because she she came out and started to support Crown Heights in a certain way. And then, you know, there was this sort of, you know, I, I like to say there's this dating period where everyone kind of like, you know, <laughs> it investigates and everyone's yeah. sort of like talking to each other and trying to, are these people I can kind of go to war with? Um, cause that's what independent filmmaking is. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then in terms of what happened after that, uh, uh Nandi was doing this beautiful play off Broadway and she, Tessa just showed up to see him. And I don't think that she really recognized, I mean, nobody really knows Nandi's uh, uh, sort of talent. I mean, that's the, the hard part about moving from the NFL to saying, I want to be an actor. And I was just like, look, dude, if you're going to do this, we have to kind of do anything but ballers. So <laughs> let's figure out this, this path over here. Um, so it was really validating for, I think, her and, uh, and other people to see Nomni on stage being an actor um, and, and really doing it the right way. Like, he's going to go do an off-Broadway play in a 99-seat theater in Union Square. I mean, this is an amazing thing. And that, that really, I think, earned a lot of respect in the community. And for that, it was really, you know, after that, you know, Tess was like, I want to do this. And the team, everybody liked it. And we said, look here's what has to happen. Unfortunately, we have to kind of fit it in between these two, you know, megalithic sort of like spaces that I'm in the middle of. And so we kind of backed into that. Once we had, uh, I think, Tessa and Namdi, then it became sort of a, sort of a, you know, kind of who's the perfect person or in my mind, in everybody's mind and the team, who's really, really the best person to play each role. And then it became just kind of reaching out to those people um, one at a time. And it, you know, there are a lot of characters in this movie. Um, mm-hmm. I know Namdi was inherently focused while we were manufacturing the movie. I think he was the one really focused on casting most of the time and really making sure it was done meticulously well, like he is. And uh, it came it came into focus one you know, one character at a time. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, how yeah. do you, how do you budget a story like this that it is is you know uh, you know yeah. hitting a smaller demo than let's say the Avengers. Yeah. In, in today's in today's world, which yeah. it's harder yeah. and harder for the audience to find the films that filmmakers are making. Yeah, yeah. I, for me, you know, um, and, and one of the things that I, I kind of take my, my students through at Carnegie Mellon where I teach, um, we, we typically would use a lot of comps where we were talking about other movies with the filmmaker. Like we spent a lot of time with Eugene saying what in this, what does the movie look like in your mind? You know, and what does the movie remind you of? What other movies does it remind you of? So we had some pretty interesting comps, um, um, uh, you know, like Carol and that kind of stuff uh, that kind of yeah. tapped tapped a certain sort of spot. Um, and uh, and we were very committed to kind of really making it very authentic. So we, we, we just really invested in Eugene's vision for that. And that included shooting uh, in on 16 millimeter and, you know, really just – really putting a lot behind the locations um and uh the real look of the movie uh it was extraordinarily I mean everything that you see uh everything that we invested is on the screen it's not in the actor's salary i'll tell you that much There's and it was did this. It, it was labor sh- of love and it was shot on super 16 yeah nice yeah nice. and declan quinn um, that, uh, the dp is such a, a wonderful guy um it, 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 i've never seen a movie graded so smoothly um by harbor and joe but 
it was already in the dailies. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's like I've never seen a movie come out <laughs> after being developed and look as good at, as Sylvie did. And I was just like, this is really something else. What that like, guy, a what d- that d- like a DP who knows what they're doing. It's shocking. Yeah, I, feel like, <laughs> I mean, what are we going to what are we going to do in color? Not much, you know. It's really something. So. Yeah, we're we're always know. we're always so used to the raw, like flat look. Now yeah. that you're like yeah. when you see something no that's l- no luts, yeah. no nothing, yeah. and, and now when you yeah. see like that's what filmmaking was. Beautiful. Oh no, when beautiful. I, I was just like, what is this? What I haven't yeah. seen this for I don't know. It was oh, it's been it's been years. It's been I remember yeah. that I've worked with DPs like that. You're just like, yeah, wow, you yeah, you kind of know what you're doing. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and 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 he. He and his entire team were actually just really lovely people. Like, uh, you know, it was nice. It was and, 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 and I wanted to touch on that real quick, that filmmakers a lot of times don't realize how important the team that you're putting together is. Because you, yeah. are, go- you are going to a war with these people. And if you've yeah. got – if you've got, I mean, look, we all have egos. That's fine. Um, yeah. But we have to keep them in check and we have to, you know, put the movie first and all that kind of stuff. But there's, if you, you pick the wrong people, man, it destroys, uh, it just, it it just, it destroys. So at any moment, uh, like the film, like the film I did, uh, the one that I shot at Sundance, I had a a very small crew. If anybody, including the cast, any one of them would have decided to give me attitude. Yeah. It's tough. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of building that team? Yeah, I think that we work with um, the, one of the most complicated art forms <laughs> humankind has ever come up with, you know, yes. and the the amount of collaboration that goes into a movie is absolutely, it's Monumental. like, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I, sometimes I'll look at, I try to, I try to, you know, I, you know, like you do, you get people who want to do this kind of stuff. And they're like, look, I'm writing a script. I'm like, let me try to be clear. <laughs> we are not building a, a, a tree fort. We are building a skyscraper. There is a lot of physics that go into that building, you know, and it looks, it doesn't look like that, <clears throat> you know, but. It looks easy. It looks easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, I try to create some metaphors for people to really get it. I come from a military background. My, my, I'm a military brat. My, 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 every single male in my entire family went into the military, except my brother and I. And after I started making movies, I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. This is like going to war. I might, might, you know, like, I mean, thankfully, nobody really hopefully usually dies. But this, the idea of the, the system that it takes to support mm. the filmmakers is absolutely jaw dropping. So every single key, every single person on the set, their energy, their flow, their intelligence, their creativity, it's all quite important. All the way down to the PAs. I mean, it's a synergy. Um, it's a synergy. It's an amazing synergy. I mean, it's absolutely great to see uh, people working together. And of course, you know, by the time you're done with thirty some odd days or whatever, how many days you're shooting, everybody's such a family. It's just unbelievable. Oh, I always, I always equate it to being a carnival worker because, <laughs> like a carny, because we are all carnies. We go yeah. off to a location. Oh, yeah, we put up our tent. Yeah. You put up a tent. Yeah. You do a show. You're yeah. really. It's you and the and your team against wherever you're at basically so you're kind of like yeah. you're you're Absolutely, relying yeah. on each other then you Absolutely. put the tent then you put the tents down you pack up and you go to the next town but when the show Absolutely. is over it's like yeah. oh it, it's such a right. relationships made on set are so intense that yeah. 20 yeah. years later you can run into oh, yeah. somebody and go dude dude it, it, dude, 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 dude where have you been, where have you been? what have you done you. Yeah, and then exactly. you sit down and you have some drinks <laughs> you're like remember that time where the the, yeah. giraffe, the giraffe got in the back seat how did that happen <laughs> dude i have so you know, everybody's got so, the, the stories are what actually make this business go because like everything else you're like what what are you talking about? Like, oh, but remember when this? I'm like, oh, that was great. That was great. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was very painful at the time, but now it's it's hilarious <laughs> exactly, to look at. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, now you yeah. had you had a lot of success with Crown uh, Crown Heights, which we're going to talk about later in the show. Uh, yeah. But wh- you sold you sold that movie at Sundance or around yeah. around the time of Sundance. Um, at Sundance, yes. That's yeah, great. So so what is the experience like of selling a film at the festival? Because we've all heard the stories of like Soderbergh and. 
you know, going to that little cafe or that little pizza joint and everybody just like yeah. making a deal on a napkin and all that kind yes, of stuff. Yes. Yeah, That's, it is very interesting. Yeah, yeah so, very so how interesting is it? Like that. Well, first, first of all, what I like about Sundance is you are – well, when I started telling my, my Carnegie – administrators look you know don't do a don't do a networking event in la nobody will come <laughs> go to sundance you know like go to sundance everybody's walking around like you just run into Ted's you know, like it's amazing and so the idea that you sit in a cafe with the buyers and you're hanging out with them is really actually the real deal and i think that's what makes it so fun is that you know first of all everyone's Everyone loves movies. Everyone's a cinephile. Everyone's got lots of interesting sort of like, you know, credibility, but taste and sort of the vibration is really quite, um, <clears throat> quite interesting. So, but selling the movies at Sundance, I think ultimately is exactly what you, you've heard. It is very much um, a market. It's very exciting. It's, it's really nerve wracking. Um, you get you, you obviously, you showcase your movie and then you guys kind of wait to see what happens. And, um, people, the buyers, you know, kind of reach out to your rep and, or reach out to you personally, and then you connect people and then you say, and then there's just this sort of like middle manning, um, that starts to facilitate the people who are dating each other, you know, and that everybody gets together and they meet and they kind of talk about sort of what the plan is or how, how would it work? And, you know, what, what would you do to support the movie? And, and you kind of try to understand exactly what the, the next level partnership is going to be with that distributor. And then once there is this sort of like, okay, this feels like um, we've gotten to know each other and we, we're feeling good about it, then there's this negotiation that goes on. And I think that's where it gets really, really interesting. Um, there are obviously lawyers and agents that can help um, you work through those kind of particulars. I think that's really also the, what comes up for a lot of independent filmmakers. Do I need an agent? Do I need a, it's like, listen, focus on what you want to focus on. Focus on making a movie. There's so much to do when you're manufacturing a movie. I, I don't mind. And I think I like having other people to share, you know, the kind of responsibilities with. And so the agents, the lawyers, they bring such a, a particularly valuable level of expertise. They, they know all the buyers, they see the market, they're studying the market while you're, you're studying filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really, really neat. You know, I've even coming up to Sylvia, I've had, I've had a, an old student who's now buying for Sony call me. Uh, she's been out, out of Carnegie Mellon for 10 years and she's like, I'm tracking your movie. And I'm like, this is, I'm having like a amazing life moment here. Like it's, it's so interesting. To see that's how awesome network plays out um yeah shout out to shout out to lakshmi but i think ultimately y you get into this sort of very surreal kind of flow and then there's this okay you know um a lot of times it looks like this you've got a couple people kind of going up against each other um and you you kind of pick the one that makes the most sense for what you're after what is what is your bottom line as a filmmaker do you want to make the money back or do you care more about a theatrical release or do you care about more of, about the personable kind of relationship with the people inside the company and do you trust those people and you know you've made a movie it's really much it's your baby it's growing up it's going to college you know where do you want that child to go and where do you think it's going to have the best chance to survive you know right. so it's a it's a really it's a really profound choice and it comes with a lot of nerves and then at some point you 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 know it's very like very much like shark tank <laughs> you, you eventually make a deal and then you go like we love you guys. And you're like, yeah, we're going to do this together. And like, like we have this like, euphoric, like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, next level, um, kind of celebration. And then you're off to the next, you know, kind of game, which is, as you know, the NFL, it's like you're, you're moving from what is a, a really interesting, very intense microcosm of cinema, you know, mm -hmm. Sundance to what is the world stage. And then it's anybody's guess what's going to happen because the market is brutal up there. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about that market because, you know, from from my experience and, and from my point of view, I've been watching and studying Sundance for over the last 15, 20 years, if not since the 90s. And what was once this kind of like, you know, uh, the, you know, Miramax, you know, buying things left and right and mm -hmm. Fox Searchlight and, and mm -hmm. all of those, you know, Paramount Vantage and all these kind of these little um, – 
micro indie labels. The money was flowing heavily back in the day, yeah. but but the yeah. and Sundance was a much more significant voice and and kind of like spotlight for films. Where in today's world, there's such. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. A just avalanche of content that Sundance yeah. still has a light on it without question. Yeah. And it's be- yeah. much better to be in Sundance than not to be yeah. in Sundance. Yeah, yeah. But the marketplace, I've noticed that there hasn't been as many deals made at Sundance. Films coming out of Sundance aren't being bought at the same rate. I mean, there was a year or two that Netflix was buying everything, that Amazon was yeah. buying everything in last year. Yeah. Yeah. Not not that much. So yeah. what's your feeling about the marketplace, how it's changing, and how do you think it's going to move forward? Because I you know, I wrote a whole book about I feel how, how the, 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 the market's moving forward. But from the Sundance experience and from a producer of your stature uh, point of view, what do you think the marketplace is doing now and where do you think it's going? I think the market works. I think, I think it really comes down to and, – and we, you know, we've said this, you know – at the studio level where we're like, we're watching the box office, you know, kind of recede and then it kind of goes up again. And then like, you know, kind of, it's all moving around. Like it's dynamic. I think the main thing is if you make a good movie, people will buy it. If you, if you, if you create good content, um, the world wants good content. So it comes down, I think usually to taste and your ability to execute something um at a certain quality and that kind of has a big part in it and then obviously with the streaming wars and the the sort Mm. of the real kind of boon um i think it's a boon um in terms of economic muscle showing up um there's a lot of uh new buyers and they're they're very um bye sweetie i love you um uh there's a lot of um I think there's a, a world of opportunity for filmmakers and I get people approaching me all the time and say, Oh, what's going to happen? I'm like, it's amazing what's happening. This is incredible. What's happening. Why is everybody so pessimistic? I, I always tell people, I was like, look, the thing that you want to keep, keep your eye on is the population of the, of the world is 7.5 billion people. And it's only going up, unfortunately. Um, and the penetration of, of, of the internet to those 7.5 billion people is only 30 percent um we've got uh, a long long way um to go um and um it, it, the boom you know the, the the boom in the internet it reminds me of sort of tv and the the, the history of of film and people were so th- threatened by it until they figured out how to partner with each other so we're in this really you know history repeating itself kind of i think phase of things um it will settle itself out everybody's got to negotiate the right equilibrium this is ultimately happening between the unions and everybody but i think it's really um it's a really exciting time to be a content creator and and i i just look at it and say look at least from where i'm sitting what i i mean i read a great script last night um by a, fil- a female filmmaker named um uh, nothing Arizona. And, uh, I really hope she gets her, her, her capital. I'm going to try to help her get this movie made. Uh, it's, it's a good script. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, great. Okay, cool. We're like, all right, we're alive. This is it because it's hard to write a good script. Oh yes. You know, it's like, it's just, okay, great. Uh, it's like diamond in the rough. I'm like, Oh great. She found one. Great. Let's go. Let's go. And so it's just craft. You know, I think you just got to focus on, if you're going to go do a streaming video, make a great streaming video. If you're going to go make a video game, make a fucking great video game. If you're going to go make a movie and you're going to be a part of that lineage, let's make a great movie and let's let's move that ball down the field. They <clears throat> they're all their own unique content. And I just I go back to that again and again and again. Just try to be good at what what it is that you're trying to do. The market will find you. Now, you working within the studio system, you must have seen a lot of directors and had interaction with a lot of directors coming in and out through these kind of genre films through Screen Gems. What was what was like if you know without calling anybody's name out? What was the like the biggest mistakes or the biggest common things that you saw that made directors? either fail or just get in their own way or something along those lines. And then on the opposite side, what was like, I mean, you kind of said it with Len Wiseman, but like, what was the other, on the opposite side, like 
this is this is how you do it right, and this is how you take advantage of something. So on the both sides. That's an interesting question. Um, I saw a lot of different kinds of directors come through, lots of different kinds of experience levels. Um, the the better directors who 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 were really experienced and, and knew how to navigate the system were used to the political uh, yeah. dynamic. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in, in a studio system, it's really interesting because it is a bit more democratic than I think people realize. There's a lot of there's a lot of group think that goes into it, and <clears throat> it, it is it is usually up to one person. Like it does have a pecking order, and there is like the big boss, and they will say yes or no. But a lot of people, what I like to say, they don't like to go it alone. You know, so there is this sort of like, well, what do you think? What do you think? And then you use a lot of research, and then and you 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 try to you try to get the best sense of what the right thing to do is. And so the filmmakers that I think were the most successful, at least in my perspective, in my mind, were the ones who were, were ready to have that much input, were, were ready to kind of listen and, um, and sort of democratically go with the flow to the point where they realized that it isn't, you know, in a tour-like environment. It's, it's um, you're answering to what I call public money, um, it is a very different kind of artistic process. You have a release date. It's, um, it's, a, it's a process of deliverables, like it's a system. You have to move on down the field whether you like it or not. Um, you have to finish that movie and hand it over. And that's, that's sort of the, 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 the rhythm of, of that. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, um, if, if the filmmakers sort of fought that or, or they created a, a bit of a stew, then what happens is the, the energy of the studio and the people, they don't want to support the filmmaker. They don't want to put, support the film. And it is personal that way. And so you start to see the, not only the economic muscle move into a different place, like it could be reallocated. Um, wow. uh, it, it almost starts to feel like the, 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 the people who really have the, um, the mechanism to do or to not do, they, they may not be able to get, may not be able to get on the phone anymore with you. It's, it's just kind of like they're personally over. They, they don't want to kind of like take that attitude or something like that. It's very passive aggressive. It's very passive aggressive in that way. <laughs> it, it, it can be, it can be aggressive aggressive. It can mm-hmm. be um, uh, directly or, or as a, as a, as a, you know, if a filmmaker has a bit too much hubris or a, a bit of an attitude or they think they know um, and they, they, they really don't have the perspective that a lot of the, I mean, I, I don't want to be rah rah the executives because some of them are really really troubling too. But a lot of the time, when you're a filmmaker, you have and and I'm saying this from being a filmmaker, so I don't mm-hmm. want to sure sure you know, sure. I, I've been through this on my own my own personally. You think you know, and, and um, the value sometimes of the executive ranks and the studio ranks is that I have I have friends who have worked on over 400 films. I mean. And they're not credited on IMDb. Um, these are people who have extraordinarily, extraordinarily, extraordinarily valuable perspectives a lot of the time. And so it's a, it's a balancing act. And I think that if you can go in with that level of, of respect, it tends to go a lot better for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard I've heard of movies, uh, studios doing this. I mean, it's legendary for some some big like you know Robert Altman or uh, I know oh, Kenneth yeah. Bra- Kenneth Kenneth Branagh, where they literally. They just literally just shut – Just they just the, – the movie goes to die. It gets released on a horrible weekend and they get no, no P&A money. They don't market it and they just literally yeah. go and kill it. And it happened obviously to Orson yeah. Welles and many yeah. of these big directors that happened. But I'd really never heard a firsthand you know, account of it. Like, well, you know, if the, they, they will – I mean obviously if it, the movie is so big, if it's a $200 million movie, they can't do that. But on the older system, where movies were done for twenty million dollars, or you know, right. they'll, they'll, they figured out we'll make our money. We're just not going to really push this guy. Yeah, it's it's an interesting mix. Uh, sometimes it's hard to actually know exactly what what's going on with those decisions because you can't see through the economic uh, or the deal. But what what I like to say in terms of wh- where the where the right equilibrium is is, is you sort of like you sort of want a studio to have skin in the game. So that they can't abandon the movie, right? Um, the filmmaker, you want them to be invested because you want them to actually chase their their actual real investment. And then, in terms of being able to get along, um, then there's actually the personal relationship, which is 
executive to filmmaker or, or just person to person, like how are people actually in our, uh, communicating with one another, how are they going with the sort of uh, the schedule, the rhythm of it, and um, and both of those things actually matter quite a bit. It's mm-hmm. quite interesting to see how they actually start to to kind of seesaw with each other. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. The the one thing I you know we've I've had many guests on this show and we talk a lot about many topics but the one area that we really haven't touched upon and I, I kind of talk about it every once in a while and it's a it's kind of like an unspoken rule that it's definitely not taught in film schools is the politics of not only in the studio system right. but the politics right. of a film set the politics totally. of de- of dealing with personalities dealing with egos. And if you're the director, which most people listening are either want to be directors or producers or, or people in, in, right. in the position of power in these right. envi- in these environments, um, that balancing act is as much of the equation is as the creative. Because I've met creative directors and I've met people who really are wonderful artists, right. but had no idea how to deal with personality, psychology, politics. Right. And I was right. told by a, an agent once, he's like, uh, what I'm looking for in a client as a director, I need uh, a filmmaker, I need a politician, and I need right. a businessman. And I go, right. those three aspects have to be – That's if you look at all the big directors ever in right. history, th- the three of them generally combine. So do you have right. any tips for filmmakers on how to navigate the politics of a set and or the politics of the studio system? That's a great question, um, and that's a, that's a very well-framed um, uh, setup, because that <laughs> couldn't be more true. Um, Appreciate it. It is remarkable. Um, <clears throat> it's remarkable because in, in what we do, sometimes when I, I talk to my Carnegie Mellon students, I'm like, listen, we're not, we're not um, writing a song. You can't get up here and just sing a song, you see. Like, right. that's, 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 a specific that's an artist. Kind of, that's an art. That's, by a, itself. that's a very specific kind of thing. Um, there's no barrier of entry. There's no economic risk to singing a song to me. And I love that stuff too. Like, trust me, it's great. But in terms of where we're going, we're going to a place where even to accomplish the smallest, you know, film, there's still an economic, you know, reality that we have to kind of understand. And so there's this business um, brain. I, I like to talk about it in terms of there's a hybrid out here. We are hybrids. We have to create a sense of uh, the economics of scale. We have to create a sense of uh, the creativity that uh, balances that. And so we talk about modeling, you know, what's the model and how to, how to kind of work within it. Um, and each of those sort of uh, bins have certain pressure points where the people who are going to be in there have certain demands on them. And it's often how they, meaning how you navigate interpersonal relationships that matter the most. So I always say to people, um, you have to respect each other and their, their ultimate specific, specific skill set that you bring to the table. This is because of this economic scale. It's the most collaborative thing that I've ever seen. Um, it's so collaborative that um, you, you have to look at everybody as a teammate, as somebody who has more skill than you have in a very specific thing that you frankly don't want to know that much about. <laughs> I, I'm not, it, like I say, I can edit, but I can just, I can just get by. I don't want to be an editor. I, mean, I, I want to be able to speak the grammar, um, but I very much need a fabulous DP, and I very much need a fabulous executive. I, I very much need a fabulous producer and a fabulous line producer and an amazing grip. I don't want to be a grip. Um, I, I'm, I'm cool just being over here and, and I'd like to tell a story and I'm interested in exactly what everybody thinks of doing with that kernel. And then, then it's sort of an organic you know, thing that kind of grows out of that. Um, so there's this sense of first and foremost getting to the point where you're so humble <laughs> Mm-hmm. That you, you're the humblest. You, I mean, you're like the most you, humble ever. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to be, and I think that I, I've certainly been worn down by life to the point where it's just like embarrassing. And I, I just, I, 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 I love what I get to do now. I feel like I'm sort of a uh, an inspirational story for people, which is why I really appreciate 
getting a chance to tell anybody about mm-hmm. it. But I think past a certain point, any time that my life has not gone right, it's because I was either betraying who I was, mm-hmm. who I personally was, or it was because I had some sort of hubris. I had some sort of attitude that I was better than somebody else, or, or there's something about that that kicked me in the head again. And, and to this point now, <clears throat> it, it's, it's just this sense of collaboration and looking at people and, and ch- picking the people that are going to be on the team with that sense of, can I trust that they have good taste and that they are able to do that job better than, than I could ever want to do? And then let it, let it ride from there. I mean, I, I think, and I, I've said this multiple times on the show, but I think it's it's as important to cast your crew as it is to cast your actors. Critical. I mean, it's absolutely critical because if you you get a DP who needs ten hours to light a corner, um, yeah. that's going to be a problem, yeah. and that corner yeah. might look fantastic, but there has to be a yeah. balance within their yeah. art form and how they do it. And then also, as a director, yeah. you need to be able to you know, collaborate, but also at the end of the day, yeah. it has to be, everything has to be filtered through you yeah. as a director, right? And yeah. dealing with these personalities, dealing with these egos, dealing with their own personal, like everyone's got their own personal crap that they're coming in. Like they're, they had a fight Absolutely. with their wife. They, you know, they're Absolutely. getting a divorce. Their kids are doing something or, you know, they got into it. They got a ticket that day. Like there's a yeah. thousand things that that's yeah. never thought about in the creative filmmaking process. It's always like, the shot that Scorsese did in yeah, Goodfellas yeah, yeah. when he did an uncut <laughs> steady cam, like that's fantastic. <laughs> right, 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 right. I, you're bringing up something which is really funny. Um, I just finished producing this movie, or we're, we're in the middle of uh, finishing it. It's called Sylvie right now, but that 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 title is going to change. It stars Tessa Thompson and my producing partner Namdi Asamoa and Eva Longoria, and it's this beautiful jazz era <clears throat> movie, and uh, it's. Uh, we're, in, we're about to lock picture right now. And um, Declan Quinn is the DP, and uh, he's sort of an iconic, you know, just like old school dude. And he, he first of all, we shot Super 16, and nice. he was, I mean, this movie looks better than most movies that I've ever seen, uncolored. Mm-hmm. And it looks fabulous. We haven't even gotten to DI yet. And, um, yeah. But at the same time, we were shooting um, this movie in, in LA uh, for New York uh, and it was just a big, big production and we were moving pretty slow, but Declan is the nicest guy in the world. He couldn't have been more sweet. And uh, you know, I'm the producer on set just trying to get this thing to move. I'm like, Declan, brother, please. Are we, are we, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. You know, and he had this just beautiful demeanor about him and everybody Everybody just responded to him. It was just loving. We're like moving through. Like, did we make our day? He's like, barely every day. You know, it's fine. But it was the way that he was able to do. I was just like, this guy's got a skill. Yeah, as really opposed right. as as opposed to many DPs that I know you and I have worked with, they're like, get out of my face, you producer. Let me be the artist. You have no idea what you're talking about. Totally. I know how to light. You don't tell me how to do my job. Totally. Do you see the difference? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, it, it was really, it was actually pretty, pretty awesome. And I think this was one of those special movies that we, we did a pickup shoot, like uh, I think two, three, two or three weekends ago. And it was like a reunion. Everybody came back, it was like uh, hugs, like, hey, good to see you. Like, oh, we've missed you. Your hair is longer. You look like you got some sun. You're like, great. You know, it was great. It was, it was really just like, all right, all right. And a lot of that has to do with my, my producing partner, Nambi, is like the most, you know, gentle spirited nicest, classiest guy on planet Earth. The guy's yeah. just an angel. So everybody's just super loving on on set. So, you know, you, you can get these great great collaborations together. And then you can also go and have like a, whoa, what, you know, this is pretty intense over here. But I think it's definitely from the top down. And you, you know? do appreciate the the latter when you deal with the with the, with the oh, <laughs> let me tell you let me tell you when you have the other one you're like oh man it, and, and that's a, appreciate the good and friends. isn't it yeah. isn't it true though once you find groups of people that you really do have a good working relationship you try to build that team up again and, and again and again yeah you try to stick, which is why i think with with some of these you know iconic filmmakers you know they're just Clint, the same yeah. people it's yeah Clint, like they're Clint Eastwood Ron Howard those guys why 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 you know, try to fix something that's not broken, you know. 
Without question. Now, you've got yeah. a chance to uh, work on a Sundance winning film called Crown Heights. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. How? Yeah. What, what was that? I mean, was that the first time you were at Sundance? Oh, gosh. That's funny. No, no. Um, I, when, when I was acting, and my first short film that I ever acted in went to Sundance in 1997. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And it was that's a, pre a really- that's that's pre uh, sex lies and videotape. So it wasn't even it was it was Sundance, but it wasn't Sundance yet, right? Or no, no, I'm sorry, yeah, eighty nine. I'm sorry, eighty nine, eighty nine. I'm sorry, that's yeah, right. yeah. It was right so it was already Sundance. Like, yeah, it it became something. It was already pretty pretty interesting. I had no idea what I was doing. It was it was me because I was a theater kid, and this was the first short that I kind of acted in, and it was it was quirky. And I, when I, when we got in, I, I don't think I realized what sort of like it meant, you know. Uh, and so I, we, I went kind of doe-eyed and <clears throat> experienced it as a as a college kid, and um, and then since then I've, because uh, I teach uh, at Carnegie Mellon a, a feature film economics course, I I told my my awesome administrators uh, Dan Martin and Dan Green there, I said, listen, you should you should take the kit, you should take the. Uh, you know, students to, uh, to Sundance every year because it's such a great melting pot. So we've been taking the, the, the class there for, I don't know, eight years or so. Oh, that's so amazing. I've been in and out of Sundance either with Sony as sort of a buyer. I've been there as a filmmaker. I've been there as a professor. And now when I came back, ironically enough, um, when Crown Heights was there and it won the Audience Award, that was the, my 20th anniversary of, of the short film, so to me, it was like this crazy Cinderella moment where, um, I mean, Crown Heights in and of itself was a Cinderella story at that festival, but 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 that was pretty pretty awesome. I felt like I had just won the Super Bowl. It was pretty pretty crazy. And and that movie so, went on to be sold to Amazon, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, Amazon picked it up at Sundance, um, and um, yeah, it was it you know it hit theaters uh, the 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 fall in the fall after. Sundance. So it is. It I, I've I've worked on a project that wasn't uh, that one Sunday. I won a few awards at Sundance, and it is a pretty. It's pretty insane. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty, pretty magical. It's pretty magical. Uh, but but do you, but do you but yeah. do you agree? I don't mean to cut you off, but the whole yeah. Sundance mythology and yeah. every filmmaker in the world wants to go to Sundance and be in Sundance, and everybody wants to God forbid win Sundance or win an Crazy. award at Sundance would yeah. be insane. But do you feel that there is this lottery ticket mentality when it comes to filmmakers where they just like they put all their eggs in the Sundance basket or oh, they're like, this is the this is the only way this is going to happen. And I always say I, I've 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 I've, <laughs> I've uh, donated to Robert Redford's retirement fund quite often. Oh, my God. And it's a donation. It's a donation. It's a Sundance yeah. donation. <laughs> I, I, I do it every time I have a project. <laughs> It's a sun. It's a Sundance donation because you're, it's 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 a lottery. T- it's a lottery <clears throat> ticket, isn't it? Yeah. What is it now? It's like the submissions are up like above ten thousand. It's something? um it's last in twenty eighteen. It was eighteen thousand two hundred. Wow. And one hundred and eighteen films, including shorts, were accepted. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's a well. This is I I I yeah. It's it's sort of this weird thing. I I look at it now, and it just has to do with the. You know, I say to my, I say this, I say this to people like we're in a content flood. You know, it, oh. it has to do with, has to do with our iPhones. And I'm picking up my iPhone here. It's like um, it's a great time to be a filmmaker, but it's also a very challenging time to because there's just so much content out there. And so even this movie that I I'm releasing in Halloween, which is called uh, Space Time, Manifest Destiny on Space Time. This is a little scrappy movie that um, is really meant for streaming. I mean, it is a virally you know, kind of, we just, I just wrote it to, to try to, you know, for these stars, these up and coming kids. To and get what's the movie the, about? What's the movie the about break. real quick? So that's, tell oh, everybody oh, what the that, movie's about. Sure, sure, sure. The movie is about these two uh, co-eds, uh, a physics nerd and a uh, uh, hot sorority girl who wake up after Halloween, um, uh, this blackout party night, and they realize that they've missed the evacuation of earth and they have to figure out what happened. And, uh, you know, chaos ensues, <clears throat> and it's um, it's a stoner comedy. It's really silly, and it's it's uh, it's just all sorts of quantum mechanics fun, and it spoofs all sorts of bullshit. It's it spoofs The Matrix and Back to the Future, and uh, it's got 
every single scene is like a little nugget for cinephiles like you and I. So, you know, nobody can take this movie seriously. That's not the goal. You know, it's really just uh, have a couple drinks or a smoke and, and let it ride on a Halloween you know, night party or something like that. And, it, uh, you know, my, my sales agent, when we first started to, to show it, he goes, oh, you've got a cult classic on your hands. This will be mm-hmm. fine. I'm like, okay, you know, it's, it's really just really uh, just all sorts of fun. Um, but um, I wrote it with this viral <laughs> mentality in mind to just try to, you know, just look at it. Like, you can give me a little bit of money. Okay, fine. This is what we're going to do. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a we, we work in a world where, you know, there's no middle ground anymore. You either mm-hmm. have stars and you can do what, what we like did on the banker where we just like, listen, without Samuel L. Jackson, this movie does not work. Right. You know, it's like the only way this works is if we have that guy. And it was a, a casting strategy to do that. But with, but with that but, said, with the cast, yeah. I just want to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to touch on the yeah. casting. You yeah. know, Sam Jackson is obviously one of the biggest stars in the world. He's very, very recognizable. And yeah. he he does do the 200, 300, 400 million dollar movies. And yeah. he'll also do a lower budget independent film. He's He just yeah. wants to work. And it's the kind of actor he is. But yep. the days of a movie star opening a movie are oh, yeah. are gone. But they yet are gone. Yeah. there are gone. So – um, you know, Sam Jackson's not going to open a movie by himself at $200 million. In, in the Avengers, he will. But at a certain budget right. range, it makes perfect sense. And that's more for international right. than it is for domestic? Or how does that right. work in your, in your eyes? But, yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, when I started at the studio, we were at a uh, 60-40 split. So the, I worked in the domestic uh, marketing environment. And so we had, we, we had sort of the green light uh, final say. Uh, in a lot of the movies because we were the majority of the market. Now with it being more like 60-40, it's, it's much more of an international green light. And, and therein lies the migration into where we stand today. Then you, then you add in the, 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 the fact that DVDs have disappeared and oh, that streaming is not, uh, not making up nearly the difference. And um, so we have this really interesting, you know, kind of uh, transition period that we're in. And uh, somebody like Sam... Uh, he he performs across the board, so it's a it's a carte blanche. You're getting your movie finance kind of thing. Um, other people don't necessarily have that punch, you know. Um, and so it's a it's a case by case experiment to kind of see where the the equilibrium is. With with, with the movie The Banker, we're good. Like Apple picked it up. They're releasing it in um, December. They're putting it in a, a small theatrical. Like we're we're in good That's shape awesome. with that one. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's actually great, and and it's a very very cool story. And Sam did it because of you know the story. It's uh, it's about um, it's written and directed by a friend um, George Nolfi, who you might remember from like Ocean series and Adjustment Bureau. It's a true story about the the first African American bankers who had to pose as uh, a chauffeur and a, a, um, a cleaning guy to to kind of help uh, a white front man that they had figured out. Uh, to buy the banks, and so they would they'd buy these banks, and they'd kind of um, that's awesome. It was it's a crazy caper ish story, and it uh, it just goes all the way to Congress, and it's an amazing an amazing film that so, came out really well. So so with a movie like The Banker, where you've got Sam Jackson, which basically is the driving force behind it, meaning uh, audience wise, the audience that you're going to find for that. I mean, obviously, the niche audience is not going to be people interested in banking. You know, Correct. heist films. It's about Which people was, who are right. It's people right. who are interested yeah. in Sam Jackson at this point. You better believe it. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and getting ahead. that script, getting that script finance was more of like uh, there were so many, so many different people who said, "But it's a movie about banking." I said, "It's a very smart script, and George is an incredible writer, and it is a movie about banking." So the marketability is tough. So we we had to kind of get over that and make it for this, make it for a smart number, and and get real cast. You know, to make it happen. So then, um, then your other movie that you just direct, the Manifest Destiny, down space time, that the opposite, yeah, it's the complete opposite. Where you, exactly. you're, you've actually developed the product, which is much more niche, which is a stoner Correct. comedy, Correct. and yeah. that is the that is the selling point of that film. Correct. You know, because there is no cast of of Correct. any marketable cast that matters. Correct. Correct. Do you Correct. think? And and this is something I've been 
you know, preaching from the top of the mountains for all filmmakers, <clears throat> especially independent filmmakers, but this obviously can work with within a higher budget range as well, is that the future, there is such a dilution of content. There's just an, yep. an insane, I mean, the TV alone, yep. I'm still catching up on HBO shows from like the early 2000s. I yep. just finished yep. The Wire for the, I mean, <laughs> literally, I mean, it was such yeah. a great show. So there's yeah. so much great content. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, yep. The only way that, a film, any film even, without major marketing muscle or major yep. star power yep. is going to be niche. So yep. the more niche you get, that's what's going to cut through all the noise. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly – the. Uh, that was my approach <clears throat> to uh, Space Time. Um, it was to try and, – and I think your, your, group, your, your, um, <clears throat> your universe will really, I think, get this, which was – you know, I had some talented clients of mine that were just, you know, I'm, I'm an artistic coach and I tried to develop, develop talent. And then I had a financer come in and said, I have this much money. Can you make a movie? I said, okay, cool. I'm going to back into this. Um, this is how much you've given me. No problem. I have these two people that, that are kind of oil and water to begin with, which is comedy gold to me. And uh, let's figure out a subject that kind of feels current. And then let's throw in as many crazy zinger one-liners that feel viral and let's make a movie. And that was it. And it, it's really designed to be laugh out loud funny, which I think for, for people who have seen it, they, they do think it's really funny. Um, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's not intended to make sense. In fact, it's making fun at the, the current science, which makes no logical sense. So that's that. <laughs> Sorry, you know, yeah. it's also existential. So for people who don't really understand existential comedy, like Waiting for Godot, it's frustrating. Is you know, like they're like, mm -hmm. it is a road trip movie that goes nowhere. It's a, and it's a stoner road trip movie that goes nowhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, you're frustrated. That's the point. Our existence on on planet Earth with Trump, it is frustrating. <laughs> so that, but, that's kind of the joke. But let me ask you this though. So. And yeah. this is where I find the smart producers and the and the artists they sometimes don't meet. This yeah. movie obviously sounds more experimental. It oh, obviously yes. it, it's yeah. obviously a little absurd. bit more experimental. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah. It's really yeah. <clears throat> you're really swinging for the fences on this, uh, yeah. meaning that you're like we think we have an audience for it. We don't oh, know, we have but no idea. Right. but right. the budget I'm assuming. Is at a much smarter point than you the banker. It. You got it. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a fraction, a fraction. It's craft yeah. services. It's craft services, basically. Exactly. The budget for craft it's, services on the banker. Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. That's, that's not a joke. It's not a joke. I mean, this is a kind of. This, you know exactly what you're saying. It is. It's that scrappy. That's all it is. It's yeah, know? but but a lot of filmmakers will try to make Manifest Destiny down space time. On yeah. a and they're going to go out for six years trying to raise twenty million dollars because that's their vision, and that's where we all and then some and sometimes every once in a while someone gives up the money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's then, true. right. We that's all true. see those yeah, movies. Yeah, You're yeah. like, how did this get financed? How? Exactly. Exactly. What is this? Who who gave? Why didn't they call exactly. me? Why didn't they give yeah. me the money? I would have done something with that. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a very interesting thing to try to find the. I, I I say the word balance or equilibrium a lot because it is that it's mm -hmm. just sort of like, well, what are you going to do? I said, and, and I, I put my artistic hat on and I said, okay, I like to I like creative challenges. I like to kind of make the most of the situation, and I do have a I do have something I'd like to say, and I can do it with this money. I can do it with this. To me, in this movie. Um, manifest Destiny now in space time. It was really, really fun. That mm -hmm. this movie was really fun to to do because it was about quantum mechanics, and I I didn't know anything about quantum mechanics oh, while doing this movie. Oh, it's awesome! And <laughs> that was so exciting. I am so grateful to have had an opportunity to make this movie because I learned so much. So. And, and to that extent, like the movie's really just to be, it, it's supposed to be a physics for dummies. It's supposed to be for people like me who grew up and missed physics class. 
And it's it's supposed to be like, hey, did you know there's something called entanglement? I'm like, what are you talking about? It's not just a, a love position. It's like, no, 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 particles entangle. Like, it's kind of an awesome thing, you know. So it's 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 making fun of myself, frankly. That's <laughs> you know, awesome. That's, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, but that's a great thing to be as an artist, where you can go out and do that and create and 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 be oh, the, so, uh, do it. Yeah. But you have to do it because it's such an expensive art form. You have to do yeah. it for a budget. You have to do it for yeah. like I, like you say a smart number, which I'm going to steal yeah. now. This I'm going to use that all the time now. You have to do yeah, it for a yeah. smart number because it's yeah. it's you know like I did my movie. I, I went to Sundance and I shot a, a narrative. Uh, you know, waiting for Guffman meets. Uh, awesome. Best of show about filmmakers at Sundance, completely guerrilla, and we did it for three grand. Awesome. And and I did I shot the whole movie. Awesome. It's a narrative, and but I can't do that for twenty million. I can't exactly. do that for a million. I can't. Exactly. I can't. I can't take those kind of risks. Exactly. You know? Exactly. But, and, but it was just good. Yeah, risk. This is a good. Uh, it, the risk is the big big word. I feel you. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I like if someone would have given me. 50 grand, 80 grand yeah. to do this. I'd be like, mm, I don't know yeah. if this is that project. I mean, it's a, yeah. this is perfectly designed for my audience. It's a perfect, yeah. it's, a, it's, who's my audience for that? People who are interested in Sundance, pe- exactly. filmmakers, my audience who know who I am and what, you know, what I do. And, and, and that's, and then maybe some people interested in the filmmaking process. That, that's, yeah. it's not a really lucrative monster, you know, it's not like a stoner comedy. There's a lot of people so who like- want stoner comedies, but not a lot of people who want it. Watch this movie, but at a three thousand dollar budget, right? I'll make twenty of those. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You know, you're you're absolutely right, and I think there's this, um, you know, in in terms of at least with you know something with with my my donor movie, there was something about it that was such a particular balance of trying to get a get sort of a a tone out. And at the same time, you are you are operating in this like little tiny economic wiggle room um, where the concept was born out of the money, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. It was as born a, as out a, of as it should in the in the independent world. Yeah, yeah, and and that <clears throat> that was just fin- that was a fantastic challenge. Um, it was just. It's crazy. You know, crazy. And, the, and the funny thing is that you have the experience of working with bigger budgets. You have the experience of working within the studio system. So I you call know it the luxury. The, the, yes, the luxury. Yes. yes, yes. They're sushi. You know I mean? They're sushi for lunch and, and lobster tail. Yeah. I get. Yeah, I, I've I've been on those sets. They're fantastic. Um, Amazing. Yeah. But right. but I, but I've also been like, let's just grab the, that slice of pizza over there, um, <laughs> right. and that's, that's dinner right. for everybody. Uh, so I've, right. I, I, right. but it is. It, I find it at least as a, as an artist much more interesting to do a movie at such a ridiculously low budget because yep. I'm free to do yep. whatever I want and you're out yep. there kind of on a tightrope without a net. And yeah. I, I as an artist I love doing that, but I have to be responsible when you do that. Again, 80 grand, not so much. 3 grand, totally. absolutely go take your risk. Yeah, totally. This this was also an opportunity for me to return to performing because I play the agent in it. So I was going around um, the lens, and for that reason alone, like I sure. put my own money in it. You know, it's like it's ever, it's like it's a, it's a, it's all in. You know, yeah. it's like this is what you do. Like this is how we do this, and like it's about the risk. And and there's just it's experimental and it's fun. Um, I'm not I'm not gonna you know jump out of the the office of when I was at Sony and, and jump into Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, which was shooting at the you know the stage across the street. Like that's just not where I'm at in my career, and I'm cool with that, you know. But but it's pretty awesome to be able to walk around and see the scale. You know, to me that yeah. that's kind of the most most fun about it. You know, it's just that that sense of the different resources that people people operate with. Yeah, it's okay. It, yeah, you know, it's like. I, I was talking to uh, there was an, uh, a director friend of mine who was talking to uh, was happened to be on set shadowing James Cameron, and wow. on on the on the Avatar set when the Avatar was wow. going on, and he wow. was there sitting there and he's just talking to him and then he started asking him like indie questions like yeah. questions like like perspectives from an independent filmmaker, sure. And James Cameron had no idea. What he he just he couldn't grasp 
because yeah. he lives in his world. He lives in James Cameron's world, which is fine. Yeah. Yeah. We need we need a James Cameron out there. We need oh, a Spielberg. Yeah. We need a Nolan. These guys who have these massive paintbrushes and massive canvases because that's what right. we go paintbrush. to the movies for. I say the same thing. It's exactly right. It, yeah. These are massive paintbrushes and that's massive right. canvases, that's right. and we that's, wa- right. that's why we go to cinema. You want totally. that? That's kept. Scale. But it was yeah. fascinating to you, like. If I tell, like when I, I was on the streets of Sundance and I was meeting producers and buzzy buddies of mine um, on while I was shooting the movie in the middle of the craziness of Sundance, and they're like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm shooting a movie. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And you could see their face just yeah, go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you. <laughs> Uh, you're doing you're, – I'm like, what? like, yeah, we're shooting right now. Yeah, the, the confusion is so <laughs> wonderful to see in yeah, their yeah. faces. <laughs> That's um, great. It's so fa- That's but great. It's a fa- but it's fascinating um, perspectives. Mm-hmm. I mean like Peter Jackson on, Absolutely. on The Lord of the Rings. Oh, man. Can you – I mean the, the, the no. scope of these, these guys Dude, is – It's an army. It's, it's an army. And also – and a lot of people don't yeah. understand the pressure – that oh. is on the shoulders of these these guys. That yeah, yeah. You got two hundred million dollars on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be a. That's a, a special kind of. You know, you don't have to just be an artist. I talk. I talked to my 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 business partner in Omni about this <clears throat> yesterday because we were talking about he's he's an NFL star, and um, he's he's moving over to. Uh, acting, and he was he, uh, he was one of the stars of Crown Heights, and we were producers on that film together. And then um, we've been producing content, um, and then we'll we'll pick a co- we'll pick a movie um, that he's going to star in very carefully. And we picked this next movie, Sylvie, the one with Tessa Thompson. I said this is the perfect movie for him to to star in because I, I like to you know when it comes to building star talent, you have to do it very particularly because people don't really understand the pressure that's on the star. They don't mm-hmm. really understand what it's like for that person's face to be plastered across the entire globe and the level of, of art, artistic integrity that it takes to build you know, a, a star that can really open a movie or just that level of success where the audience responds to the fact that they... They go to the movies because they know that person makes good content. They they go they're 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 loyal to that star, like Sandra Bullock. I worked on Premonition, and she's called she's evergreen. We call her evergreen. She'll she'll open a movie, and the box office will sustain way beyond the norm because Sandra Bullock just has this sense, of, you know, this loyal following. You know, to create that level of value in the consumer's mind, to be of that much service to them. Mm-hmm. To be of service to the to the to the audience that you work for them, uh, and, and, and to allow that to really be developed in a in a in a in a way, it comes up for my partner and I because he has such specific classy taste, and this next movie is is really quite classy. And then the next movie that we are planning to produce after that is is very special and, and will be more risky for him in terms of what he can do with his acting chops. Mm-hmm. But that sense of being able to just take baby steps and just grow organically the, the next from this, you know, this rung to the ladder to that rung, not that rung. Mm-hmm. Don't go up there. You know, just just very, very mindful of the learning curve and just the level of responsibility that you're taking on both economically, artistically. Those things are really interesting to me, you know, especially at my age. I just find it to be fascinating. I, I, um, I, 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 I've, I've always found it very interesting to study uh, Tom Cruise's career because he oh, is man. just – he is one of those actors who exactly what you said, to be of service to the audience. He he does yeah. his own stunts. He does what I he does. He, I mean, regardless if you like him, don't like him with all the stuff that he sure. goes through. Of course. As an artist, as an actor – as yeah. a businessman within the yeah. film industry, man, he delivers, man. Those Mission Impossible movies, like he's literally yeah. hanging yeah. from that oh, airplane. Man. Like and he- I just watched, <laughs> I know, I missed the last one and I just watched it two weekends ago and I was just like, just, yeah, just, it's unbelievable. Just, I was just, just like, I oh, forget. It's just like it's just. Yeah. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't even. I just can't yeah. even. And the guy's what? Yeah. One hundred and five now. How old is he? <laughs> I, mean, I know. I know. 
I know. He looks he mo- like he's been drinking formaldehyde for years. You know? No, he bathes in, ch- in, in baby's yeah. blood. That's that's basically that's right. what I heard. I've heard that through the grapevine. That's how he stays so youthful. <laughs> Him and J-Lo, uh, yeah. they have the same uh, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something going on there. I don't know. Yeah. Now, uh, sure, so I want to ask you. Um, a f- I'm going to ask you a yep. few questions uh, that I ask all of my my guests. But one okay. last question I want to ask you <laughs> before we get to the final questions is: yeah. Do you think that filmmakers moving forward, especially independent filmmakers, but even at filmmakers who aren't as independent? I mean, you do independent films like like Space Time, but you also do larger budget projects with larger stars as well. Right? Do you believe that filmmakers really need to start treating or start uh, approaching filmmaking in an entrepreneurial spirit and more oh. of like a, like a, I, I coined the term film entrepreneur. So it's kind That's of good. like, yeah. which is like looking at it, like how, how can I, how can we recoup our money? How can we maybe generate other revenue streams from these films? How can we build right. out businesses? How build our portfolios, all that kind of stuff. Even on a, even at the $5,000 movie level, dude, if you, totally do twi- if you do 20 movies at $5,000 a piece and each of those make $20,000, that's a business. And if it Absolutely. keeps – Right? So what's, what's your point? What's, what do you think? I, 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 we live in a world where that's, that's, that is front and center now. I mean with the YouTube generation, the influencers, the content creators, uh, people like Gary Vee. I mean these people are yeah. extraordinary. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very intrigued and, and, and fascinated by, by – by that um, manifest testing down space time isn't going to ever make its money back in terms of what what it's getting streaming. But I've got these crazy, you know, t-shirts and cups where if people actually like it, they just go to the mall and they can buy a, a t-shirt that says, "I'm not having sex with you again, fucker." You know, it's like that's just funny, like sticky stuff. So there is this um, there is this full service mentality that I think as filmmakers we have to have today. And it's just part of the way. Um, and, and interestingly enough, historically, film is an entrepreneurial business. It always was. It's called uh, Disney. It's it, called Disney. I mean, seriously. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, it's hist- historically, it, it's a group of entrepreneurs that, that left New York to, to, to form Hollywood. Right. And ever, you know, it, it wasn't until vertical integration in the 60s that public money came in and, and everything kind of like got kind of wacky do. Mm-hmm. Um, but look where we are now. I think fundamentally, it's still a great, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be a filmmaker. We have to continue to be entrepreneurial. You know, you brought up Sex Lies and Videotapes. These are extraordinarily smart movies that are very, very creative and, and, you know, mixing media like that one did and finding just new ways to create really interesting stories. And I think it continues to go back to this. A lot of people say, like, well, it's so competitive. It's, like, it's competitive because we still have to sharpen our pencils. Like, we need to be good storytellers. Mm-hmm. That's, what we're, that's what people are just looking for, good stories. They're looking for good stories that are $300 million, right? And they're looking for good stories that are like eight thousand dollars. Like it's storytelling. Yeah, and I was I, I talked to a friend of mine at uh, he works at Disney Animation, and he was telling me, I'm like, how how much how, how much did they make? He told me like he was telling me how much the 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 the, the, the animated movies were making, the, how they broke it oh, down, yeah. like they did the whole. We made this much from this, this like from merchandising from this and that. Yeah, and he goes, yeah. when it came to Frozen, <laughs> oh man, get, get out of here. Frozen made a billion. In in box office, yeah. But how was, much how much do you think they made on the dresses? That's it. Just the little dresses that my daughters bought and every other oh, yeah. little girl bought. How much do you think they made off of just the dresses? Oh, it has to be a lot. I'm sure a billion dollars on the yeah, dresses. Yeah, I was gonna say because <laughs> Disney I, Disney makes twenty billion a year at least, and doesn't it? It's like the ratio is amazing. It's a toy company. You know. Oh no, they're merchant. I mean, I mean, I mean crazy. it's like George Lucas says: the money's in the lunchbox, guys. Absolutely. I mean, it's. But they're entrepreneurs. Disney's an entrepreneurial. Absolutely. I mean, they they're not about just making a movie, and then just selling that movie as the product. It's about yeah. thousands well, of other ancillary. But that's that's why they're winning. Yeah. And boy, are they! Whether you like it or yeah. not, they're definitely winning. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and by, real quick, you made a movie for Netflix as well, right? But with uh, Brie Larson. Oh um, well, the Brie Larson movie was uh, Basmati Blues. That's 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 probably on its way into that that distribution model now. It's um it's a musical um, mm-hmm. with uh, Donald Sutherland and Tyne Daly, and mm-hmm. shot that in Mumbai. That was quite quite a quite an amazing adventure. 
And you shot, um, and you and you produced that one as well. I co-produced that. Yeah. Okay. And what was it like working with Netflix? I've always, I just love asking producers who work with Netflix. I hear wonderful stories. Well, I have that that movie was made independently, and then oh. it went into distribution through Shout Factory, and and it's been, you know, handed over into the sort of, you know the streaming environment. I haven't personally worked directly with Netflix, although I have some friends, some dear friends who are working at Netflix now, and I'm you know, you know, it's just it's an amazing. I mean, the the the, the evolution of that com- company is is unbelievable. They changed so. the game. They changed the entire industry. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, they changed the entire. This is is, is where it's like, yeah, whether you like it or not, like this is what's happening. You have to figure out what it means for everybody else, you know? Where do you think, where do you think this is all going to go? I mean, I mean, because I feel that what we're going through now with the the industry, the film industry is what the music business went through five, eight, eight years ago. Yeah, that's exactly where my mind went to. And I've been thinking about that even coming up, you know, for Manifest Destiny's on Space Time. <clears throat> um, that was written at a time when Trump was not president. Mm-hmm. And that's the joke. It's actually, it's sort of like a doomsday scenario about Trump. If, if Trump had won, this is what was going to happen. Sure, sure. And, and even just in the last five years, um, looking at sort of how that process has evolved to today, it's, it is this, um, you know, dilution uh, of, of the, the flood itself, the value itself, and, and how we monetize things, it's changed uh, drastically. So I, d- I don't know in terms of uh, the, what, what we might say is the correction in the marketplace. I, I think that it, it puts a lot of pressure on us storytellers to be even better at what we're, what we're doing. It, it puts a lot of pressure on us to be uh, to find a certain uh, unique voice and and try to you know cultivate our own sort of um, our own fan base and, and develop ourselves in sort of our own way and um, you know there's this uh, amazing expanding um, uh, global uh, universe and I think that's what gives me hope. A lot of people get very doomsday about movie making and I said why. That the, the, the expansion of the internet, we're only at 30 percent penetration to the seven billion people out there. You know, this is a this is an upward economic picture. It really just depends on you know where you're focusing your own integrity and where you're focusing your own skills, and uh, and not limiting yourself. I think um, more importantly than anything. So, you know, like for me, I've got projects that you know I'm working on with clients or collaborators that are really really inexpensive things because. Who's to judge? It's not about the budget, you know, to me, you know, it's sort of like there was, there used to be the sort of like, well, you know, you're working on Spider-Man. I was like, so you're working on Spider-Man. I know what that's like. You know, that's, that's 5,000 people all running around and who's really in charge? You know, it's not, that's not this. So it's, it's sort of where, where you can find your own sort of peace of mind inside um, the, the, the opportunities is more important than ever. Right. And, and like in the film and like in the music industry, you know, artists now, the money is not in publishing. It's not in radio That's plays. Right. It's in concerts, per- touring, T-shirts. Right. And then now they're right. even doing like autograph and photo ops. They're selling right. f- for, for VIP tickets and they're just – right. it's, the, it's the new world. It's the new world right. that we live in. And I think filmmakers need to think that way moving forward. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very complete entrepreneurial – um, you know, spirit. Without really question. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. Ask you if, I'll ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. What advice sure. would What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Uh, a, a filmmaker, I would say, focus on your your writing skills. Um, I think that uh, you know it's interesting to me um, how important that skill is and continues to be, and it's one of the fundamentals. Um, and I often meet meet filmmakers and and various type of of you know crew and all that kind of stuff who who want to be writer directors or want to want to want to direct something. And I often just say, well, directors usually come in in a lot of different directions, but 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 usually there's like this writer director that becomes 
um, mm-hmm. the, the real kind of voice that were like, wow, how'd they get there? They wrote, they wrote, they wrote that script. You know, there's something about that, that I don't think that's going to change. So focus on writing skills. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Um, the lesson I'm learning lessons every day. <laughs> we all I are. Just went through this morning. Yeah. Um, I, I think the lesson, um, for me, it has to do with just usually with money, um, how to, how to work with the amount of money that you have to, to do what it is that you're ultimately trying to do. And that comes down to being okay working in baby steps. Um, it's, it's so often that people are like, well, I want to do that. I said, good, that's a big dream. How does that, how does that start? It starts with you putting one foot in front of the other mm-hmm. and discipline. Um, I come from a military family background, and I think discipline is one of the more fundamental things because it's in your control to have. Everybody can have discipline. You can have discipline right now. It's really just letting yourself kind of get into a mechanism and taking one step in, in, in front of the other. Like, like the banker, uh, Joel Vertel, who's the lead producer, He's been developing and working on that film, I think it's for 20 years. That project has been in development since he was at Paramount. And that was, for both of us, 15, 20 years ago, he picked that thing up. So these, are, these, stories, these stories take a long time you know, to, to come to life. And that's good. That's mm-hmm. okay. You know, just take your time. Be patient. And for me, I think that's been one of the harder ones to really come to peace with, you know, patience. What is the biggest fear you had to overcome when making your first, uh, your first film as a director? Yeah, that's judgment. You know, <laughs> that, that sense of people are going to not, they're not going to like this. Uh, for me, when I, when, I, I, when I started directing because I'm such a musical theater nerd, like musical theater people get my sense of humor. Mel Brooks people do. Like, I'm a weird, weird director. No question. Um, getting a sense of just that, that zany, like, you know, tone, that, that is a, a place where you're just, I go in knowing that a vast majority of the market is not going to like me. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's just that. Like, but those people who get it laugh and, and, and we share a smile, we share a wink, you know, so I'm pretty cool. I feel better about that now. Um, and certainly with Manifest Destiny Down Space Time, that's a departure into absurdist theater. It's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously. And, and, yeah, it's nuts. And so people who are like serious, I'm like, no, no, go see Waiting for Godot and then, then call me. Like, this is frustrating. This is, this is like, a, you know, it's supposed to be challenging and that's, that's okay. You know, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, now, what are, the th- what are your f- three favorite fears, um, excuse me, three favorite fears, three favorite films of all time? The Producers. Um, oh, great movie. Dr. Strangelove. And I would say, you know, I had to say about the original Star Wars, like, of course, it's, something, it's, some, something, I mean, I just, I'm such a, a, a John Williams fan. I miss, I miss melodic musical themes in cinema today. Like mm-hmm. if you're a composer out there, melody, melody, give me something, uh, give me something to like bring my spirits to life. So yeah, that's, those are, those are those. Now, where can people uh, find uh, more uh, more about what work you're doing and uh, your films? Yeah. Okay. So um, you are more than welcome to check out what I'm up to, uh, jbprodinc.com, or um, Instagram, jbstudioLA is where I do a lot of my like coaching and that kind of thing. And then for Manifest Destiny Down Space Time, you can find me on social media. Uh, Space Time uh, is really the one to kind of search for, but Manifest Destiny Down is uh, manifestdestinydown.com is the website, and you can you can IMDb me whatever you want. Very cool. And you are Jonathan number f- Jonathan Baker number five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are a lot of Jonathan <laughs> Bakers out there, and I'm the, I'm number five. So okay. you know, everybody's. I got to meet them all. I, I kind of want to have like a John Baker club and be like, hey, let's all get together. Like, let's all hang out. I, th- I think some of us actually look alike too. So it's just like. <laughs> scary it's, it's, awesome. it's it's quite scary sir uh jonathan so. it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show thank you so much for thanks. coming on man thanks so.
Yeah, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. I really want to thank Jonathan for coming on and sharing his life experience in the business with the tribe. Thank you again so much, Jonathan, for dropping those knowledge bombs. If you want links to anything we talked about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 372. Now, guys, before I go, I just want to ask you for a huge favor. First of all, thank you guys so much for everyone who's left a review and sent me messages about On the Corner of Ego and Desire, which was released this week on Tuesday. It's been amazing to finally get this movie out to the tribe, and you guys seem to be really, really loving the film. And I want you to ask a favor for every from everybody in the tribe. If you can, please head over to the IMDb page of On the Corner of Ego and Desire because we had a couple of haters that launched some sort of like little mini attack against the film before the damn thing was even released. They did it on Monday, for God's sakes, and it dropped the rating of the film down dramatically. So if you have seen the movie, all you got to do is just go to imdb.com and and check and, and look for On the Corner of Ego and Desire. I'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can uh, just click on it easily. And just if you, if you like the film, just leave it 10 stars. You don't have to write a review. If you want to write a review, great. But just rate it at 10 stars. It's going to help us out a lot, bringing the rating back up. It started off at like 2, so we're already up almost at 4.5 or so. So you guys have been doing a lot of that already, so I do truly appreciate that. And if you have seen it on Amazon or iTunes or anywhere that you did see it, please leave a review. I do need to get to 100 reviews before 30 days on Amazon so the algorithm can start giving the film a lot of love. So I really, really want your help. I want the help of the tribe to get this film ranked higher and higher on Amazon so more filmmakers can see it and hopefully enjoy the film. So if you want to check out the film, just head over to Ego and Desire Film. Dot com. That's ego and desire film.com. There's links everywhere you can watch it there. It's available on Amazon, iTunes, uh, of course, Indie Film Hustle TV, which is the only place where you can get the six hour plus special edition version where you can uh, rent it there, uh, buy it there, or uh, you watch it as part of your subscription to Indie Film Hustle TV. Uh, it's also available on Tubi and I think on Google Play as well as YouTube TV and a few other places out there as well. It's out there, guys. So thank you guys again so much for the support. I got some stuff cooking for the next few months, so keep an eye out because you know me. I'm always doing something to help the tribe out and get some stuff out there for you guys. So thanks again so much. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com.